Fair use notice. This video may contain copyrighted material, the use of which has not been specifically authorized by the copyright owner. We are making such material available for the purposes of criticism, comment, review, and news reporting, which constitute the fair use of any such copyrighted material as provided for in Section 107 of the U.S. Copyright Law. Notwithstanding the provisions of sections 106 and 106A, the fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, review, and news reporting is not an infringement of copyright. California had a problem with prison gangs and decided the best way to deal with it was by locking up the leaders in a place so impenetrable and isolated they'd be out of contact and out of business. But things did not go according to plan. This is a story about how a bunch of gangsters went to one of the most maximum security prisons in the country and turned it into their criminal headquarters. And here it is, Pelican Bay State Prison, the super maximum penitentiary in Northern California. And yet with all the surveillance and isolation, gangs still run thriving criminal enterprises out on the streets from within this fortress. Lieutenant Steve Perez, a senior official at Pelican Bay, took us on a tour. These are the most creative, most ingenious, and I'm deeply committed to achieving their criminal goals. Perez took us to a place called the SHU, the Security Housing Unit, a special prison within the prison, where gang leaders are housed in nearly solitary confinement. They're locked up in their cells 22 and a half hours a day, searched regularly for weapons, their personal effects x-rayed for contraband. They get to exercise for about an hour a day in a small, dreary yard, their only companion, a surveillance camera. And yet Lieutenant Perez says they managed to outwit the tight security to plot and scheme with one another. They will use a drain right here, and to they talk, talk through this drain. In fact, you can talk quite a ways down, because they're basically, when we designed the the, uh, the draining system, we connected a number of these individual exercise yards together, never thinking that this is how they would begin to communicate. And there's little the prison can do about it, well, since with all the rain in Northern California, they can't plug the drainage system. And now what we do is we pay attention to what they're saying. We listen as much as we can. Lieutenant Perez showed us other ways the inmates spoil the security. He brought us onto a cell block where well, we spoke to Brian Moore of the Aryan Brotherhood, a white supremacist prison gang. Well, how long have you been here? In the shoe bag? Yeah. Since uh, 99. Moore, who's serving 18 to life for second degree murder, can't see his next door neighbor or anyone else on the block. And yet they communicate by what they call fishing. What is fishing? You just take uh, your little string line right here with little weight on it. A string line. Now, yeah. you made that? Yeah, I just what? got a torch sheet. He makes the line 40 feet long by tearing up his underwear or his bed sheet and braiding the threads together. And he fashions a weight out of soap. You just throw it out the door and somebody else throws their other line out. Just then, a written message came flying down from the upper tier. Brian demonstrated how he fishes by flinging a line out, hooking it around the other line, and reeling it in. Once Brian ties the two lines together, the inmates easily send messages back and forth. If you know that they're fishing, mm -hmm. and they're sending messages like this, why do you let it go on? We don't. The officers are required to search so many cells every day. The officer will come in, if he finds a fish line, he will take it at that time. The problem is that no sooner than I take it, he will go back to his bed sheet and he'll unravel the string again, the threads, and start the process all over. With inmates that have nothing to lose, the authorities are left with nothing but frustration. Do I leave my machines? Do I take his t-shirts away? Do I leave him naked in a cell? How's that going to sound? Once they communicate with each other, the most effective way they get their messages to their foot soldiers on the outside is through the mail which is one of their rights guaranteed by law. This is the guy who's the head of that one organization in Southern California. 
Trained prison investigators like Devin Hawks scrutinize every letter that goes in and out of the shoe, an average of 2,000 a day. One case involved a member of the Mexican Mafia. We reviewed over 1,000 letters that he sent out. And in those letters, uh, we found evidence of over 500 crimes that he committed. It involved uh, drug trafficking, assaults on people, murder. Um, that he was directing from inside the prison? That he was either directing or that was being reported back to him through the men. How did he get all that stuff out of the prison? Well, they use code. They use codes that have been so hard to decipher, they have been sent to FBI cryptologists in Washington. With nothing but time alone in his cell, Brian Moore spent years learning an ancient Norse language that hasn't been used since 600 AD. I've got a key right here for you if you want. Show me a key. See across the top right there. Got the ABCs. That's the A, B, and I can match them up. Like other inmates, he sends out encoded messages embedded in intricate artwork. Would you mail this picture to... I would mail it to a girlfriend, and then a girlfriend would mail it to, to a homeboy or somebody else, somebody that I wanted to pass the message to. Okay. And so what happens is that when this goes out, if you're not paying attention to what's happening, if you're not looking for the indicators of how they communicate, a beautiful piece of artwork becomes a message to have someone kill. Here, on an FBI surveillance tape, is a group of gang members meeting in a California hotel room to discuss their latest orders from Pelican Bay. This is coming from the I'm conveying to you what the Iron Man wants. Pelican Bay authorities have had some success getting inmates to flip by offering them a deal in exchange for telling how crimes are being hatched and orchestrated from within the prison. They're given privileges and moved into a segregated wing off the shoe. How easy was it to get messages in and out? Easy. Easy. Real easy. Real easy. Real easy. These four men took the deal. Epi Cortina brutally beat and murdered a fellow gang member. He lived on the shoe for nine years before he renounced his membership in the Mexican American gang Nuestra Familia. Epi, uh, tell us what kinds of crimes were perpetrated, ordered from within the shoe for Nuestra Familia? Anywhere from murder money laundering, bank robberies, on the car robberies, home invasion, drug deals, prostitution. Miguel Perez gunned down a witness in a murder trial. He has told prison officials how his old gang, the Mexican Mafia, dispatches orders in the visiting rooms. One of the things that, that we learned was sign language. So this way, if we've seen someone, you sign to them. But that, I don't understand that. They're watching you. They're listening to you. You are never not being videotaped, observed. How, did, how do you do that? I use regular sign language. It's easy for you to go and understand it. You pick it up because if you knew it, yeah. yeah, you know it, but we throw our own stuff in there. These men all say they want kids on the street to know that gang life is a sham. Loyalty, honor, it's not there. There ain't no such thing. It may be something that's fed to you, but it's not true. Can you leave a gang? I always thought. You no, know, you can't walk away from it just like that. Did they not to answer your question simply? Yes, they want us there. They Each want and every dead. one of us. Each and Especially every one. Especially more so now that they get to see the gen of you. We're the ones that are speaking now. You're automatically marked for death. You're marked for death? Yes. The gangs at Pelican Bay are organized like the military, with strict discipline that includes going to school. Not in the traditional sense. They go to gang school. Learning, for instance, how to make weapons from materials the state is required to give them. Here in this prison video, an inmate demonstrates how he constructed a crossbow out of elastic from his underwear, writing paper rolled tightly, and a plastic spoon sharpened into a lethal point. It's made specifically to be fired through the mesh door. <coughs> Pelican Bay's Jim Dejeuner showed us a display of prison-made weapons. Oh, yes. yeah, since August of 2002, we've confiscated about 1,258 weapons. Well, show us some of the more incredible ones, because they all look incredible to me. Inside of a shoe cell, they have the a metal frame door, then embedded metal. This here was cut right out of the door, and this is a real recent uh, discovery. The particular inmate that did this 
He, he makes one of these about once a month. I hear that some of these guys can actually make handcuff keys. Oh, in the security housing unit, all the gang members know how to uh, make handcuff keys. This particular handcuff key oh, here, look at that. this was manufactured from an inhaler, just the metal part of an inhaler, and they shaped it into a handcuff key. And that would unlock a oh, definitely. The gangs place a huge emphasis on formal education. We discipline ourselves to study at least three or four hours a day. Bob Overton, who knifed someone to death in a bar, has left the Aryan Brotherhood. He says they make themselves smarter in the service of crime. What kind of literature were you reading? What kind of books? Tactical books. Uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Uh, he did. Musashi's The Book of Five Rings. Machiavelli. Books about can... power. Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. You did too. Psychology books. Psychology books. Business. Wall it's very, it's very important. Your organization did a lot of business. Yes. Stephen Gruel, a former federal prosecutor who investigated Epi's gang, says it ran its operations like a Fortune 500 company. In this surveillance video, members of Nuestra Familia are holding what Gruel calls a business meeting. Here you have the, the regiment leaders coming from uh, San Francisco, from San Jose, from Salinas, from Visalia, from Oakland, sitting around for a meeting. Meeting of the cities. One of the, one of the members brought <coughs> this document. And so what you have is an agenda. And, you have to uh, see some of these words. The, the, the main uh, topics were management, right. infrastructure, goals, and objectives. Right. I mean, the fact that that came out of prison and out of the teachings and the work of the Nuestra Familia is, is quite frankly, no surprise. He came to respect their business savvy, which included opening accounts at legitimate banks. You know, the proceeds in those accounts are probably from drug dealing or murder for hire or robberies. Is this a huge enterprise? The Nuestra Familia probably has uh, in excess of a thousand or so members and associates. So it's, it's you know, not a small band of individuals. It's large in nature. They were getting so large, they began to expand their field of operations. And they were starting to move into um, Boise, Idaho, of all places. Boise, Idaho. We also saw that they had some activities in Arizona. So what they were slowly trying to do, I think, is become a larger criminal organization. They certainly had the manpower to do and it. And this is still all being run outside of this sort of high-intensity prison, this lockdown kind of place. Pelican Bay served as the nerve center for all the operations for the Nuestra Familia. So a prison built specifically to put vicious gangs out of business ended up with the worst of the worst all in one place with nothing but time to forge fraternities that were tighter, better organized, and smarter. How do you deal with those people? You know, how do you deal with someone who has impunity? They're in prison, in the worst prison. So what do you do with them? The government's solution to the problem and gang secrets from an insider who defected in a moment. And I've been investigating one of the most ruthless gangs in the country, Nuestra Familia, which means our family in Spanish. Founded by Mexican-American convicts in the California prison system in 1965, it consisted of just a few hundred members until the past decade, when with its top generals confined to the maximum security wing at Pelican Bay, called the SHU, it swelled into a super gang with more than a thousand made members and associates. It was built on the ethic of loyalty, discipline, and fear. And law enforcement was unable to penetrate its solid walls until one of the top carnales cracked. The Nuestra Familia is considered one of the most sophisticated prison gangs in the United States. Like so many others, Robert Bratton joined Nuestra Familia in the 1990s while he was in prison. He rose to the rank of captain, but eventually defected and told the government the gang's secrets. Now in hiding, he agreed to talk to us in disguise. To join it, murder is a prerequisite. You have to murder someone to join the gang? You have to make a kill or spill the blood of the enemy to be trusted into the gang's clandestine activities. Did you do that? I've stabbed different people. 
Grattan spent two years in the SHU going to Gang University, taking orders from the Nuestra Familia leaders, who they called generals, and then he was paroled. I was giving, given uh, specific orders to organize all the different little cities in Northern California, which at that time consisted of thousands of young kids who were straying from the goals of the leader. So My, you were called on to, to whip unite. this thing into shape again. So I put together a um, gangster rap CD to reach the youth and let them know that the Nuestra Familia was still in charge. Grattan's CD called GUN glorified gang life and called for death to the Sereños, their rivals. I'm the one straight gunner at say, I'm still going in order to death. It also contained a message from Grattan for the youth of Northern California. The primary purpose and goal of this album is to promote unity amongst each and every one of us. Did the CD sell? I mean, was it, it in, in it music sold thousands? It was. It, 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 it was so popular in Northern California that the police chief in Watsonville, California, actually organized a um, boycott of Sam Giddy's. This CD put out by this gang was sold at Sam Goody. It was. Sam Goody pulled the CD, but after it helped generate about $80,000 in sales, 25% of which, under gang rules, Grattan had to kick back to the generals. He says he deposited that money in a Boise, Idaho bank account that they controlled. What keeps someone in your position who's out taking these orders from the guys in? I mean, why not? Set up your own organization. Why not? Why don't you become the more powerful one? The same way that the Nuestra Familia has no problems um, killing the enemy, um, it would also kill any member who turned coward, traitor, or deserter. If you try to get out in any way, they're going to kill you. And if they can't get you, they will go after your family. Grattan says he was having misgivings about the gang when he was arrested for drug possession and faced another long stint on the shoe. I had already wanted to walk away from the gang on my own. This just kind of sealed the deal. Robert Grattan was probably one of the most significant, if not the most significant, cooperator in this case. Stephen Gruel was the lead prosecutor in Operation Black Widow, the largest and most expensive investigation of a prison gang in U.S. history. We already knew who they were. We knew who were the leaders. We knew who were the shot callers. You and knew that the leaders were in prison? We did. You knew that? We did. We found that out, and, and that's the irony of this. We had to deal with a situation where the leaders were already behind bars. He says the big break came when Grattan handed over the latest secret codes used by Nuestra Familia. They were written in ultra-miniature script on tiny pieces of paper called wheelers that were smuggled out of Pelican Bay. Here's one he actually provided to us in its original form. It says the following will be code words for drugs. We're going to call uh, cocaine soda. Uh -huh. And tennis shoes are going to mean handgun. Uh, high tops are going to mean a rifle. Boots, if you see boots in, in some sort of letter, it's going to mean an Uzi. So this teeny, teeny writing, this is the way they would pass the new code. Right. Because they kept changing it. Wheelers were regularly smuggled in and out of the most secure prison in all of California in things like this Thanksgiving Day card. Looks innocuous, oh. kind of nice, you know. Yeah. If you were a prison guard, would you, you know, think much of it? No, it's just another card, you know, no big deal. Well, we found this, and then we slowly started to peel some parts of it back. And what we found oh. were three wheelers. Robert Grattan says that when he sent messages into the prison, he used a variety of techniques to fool the guards, including writing in urine. It's undetectable to the naked eye. If I had urine in a, in a cup, mm -hmm. I could write a message on a piece of paper, which wouldn't be detected until it was heated. You've done it. Yes. Perhaps the gang's most brazen way of communicating was through fake legal documents. Looks like something you would think is, you know, some sort of court document. It's got the caption, etc. 
But if you start getting down to the second page, well within the body, building up of this organization on the outside will be done in these three steps. Bam. Who on earth wouldn't think that was a legal document? And then you're not supposed to scrutinize that in the yeah. same way as you do letters ex ex that they send in and out. Yeah, but this is you know a clear example of abuse of a privilege, so they can get their uh, orders and functions out on the street. Once uh, the codes were understood and the messages intercepted, Operation Black Widow turned up ten hit lists. The cops had to call three hundred people to tell them there were death threats against them. So Gruel yeah. says they prevented scores of homicides that were already in operation. For example, uh, we uncovered that there was a plot to uh, murder two district attorneys you know, in California. And um, as a consequence, we were able to you know, identify those involved in that plot and arrest them and, and uh, convict them. In all, Operation Black Widow resulted in 150 arrests. But now what to do? Clearly locking them up together at Pelican Bay didn't work. So now what the government wants to do is disperse the leaders around the country in various maximum security prisons in the federal system. We're going to move them to Indiana, in Florence, Colorado, in Marion, Illinois. Uh, and each prison will have one of these captains or what? one of these generals. Yes, one of these lifers. But oh, couldn't they start a, a whole new organization in whatever prison they're in? I don't think that's going to happen. And, and the reason why is this. There are two essentially identifying characteristics of being a member of the Nuestra Familia. One, Mexican-American. The other is that you're from Northern California. So if you take a general and put him in Marion, you know, uh, Illinois, uh, or in you know, Minnesota, or some other institution in Arkansas, he's going to be a nobody. It's too late. They've already reestablished new lines of communication, new so contacts. You, you're telling us that even if from today these generals are broken up and one is in Connecticut and one's in Pennsylvania, they're still going to be able to run this criminal organization in Northern California. Not right? only are they going to run it, it's going to expand. They're going to be able to recruit and they're going to prosper. I know what uh, Granton is talking about. And, you know, uh, we'll have to see. You know, I don't have a crystal ball to kind of tell, to tell you with certainty what's going to happen. But, you know, I thought it was worse to do nothing. You had to do something with the situation. You couldn't let these guys, you know, go on with impunity. But back at Pelican Bay, Lieutenant Steve Perez and the prison senior gang investigator, Devin Hawks, say the leaders of Nuestra Familia, aware they may soon be split up, are already plotting. They're not ignorant, men. They Clearly. have a plan, a definite plan, like any business organization that is successful. And they stay with that plan. That plan was spelled out in a coded letter intercepted from the shoe. This is the actual letter. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, we've highlighted where the code is. Before every comma is the word. And what was the message? Well, the message is that the Nuestra Familia is reorganizing. New captains and generals have already taken over on the shoe. And as this deciphered message shows... The generals heading off to places like Indiana and Minnesota are going with a stated mission. It says these Carnalis, that's what they call an NF member, are mandated to organize our organization in the feds and place regiments in other states other than California. They will do so under the authority of this new general. As I understand what Devin is telling us, this letter that you intercepted is, is mandating that these people who are being sent away from here around the country are to set up the same kind of internal prison gang system exactly. that you're trying to break up here. Exactly. And it's a mandate. These men will go out into the federal system and continue to branch out to create new gangs and continue their gang activity. California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger will decide later this year whether to go ahead with that plan to scatter the gang leaders throughout the federal prison system. If he rejects that idea, they will remain at Pelican Bay, serving out their life sentences.